Good afternoon. Welcome to today, Wednesday, uh, June 27, 2018, Spar Engineering Live Google Hangout. Uh, today, we hope to have a, a really good, interesting, lively show. Uh, we have some of the, the leading expert from uh, research from UL. I uh, have the director of UL FRSI, Steve Kerr, with us, as well as a couple technical panels. We have Captain Chad Christensen from LA County, uh, Lieutenant Nick Papa from New Britain, Connecticut. And I wanted to take some time and talk about the current fire service research. Uh, all of us have questions. All of us have things that we thought we believed at one point, and we've been shown that it may not be so accurate. Uh, we have things we've been doing on the fire ground for 10, 20, 30 years, and now we're learning that there may be a better way or a different way to do some of that stuff. And we all have questions. Uh, we see lots of questions on a regular basis on social media. We see lots of questions through conversations and debates and, and fire, firehouse chatter. So I figured it was a good opportunity uh, to bring Steve Kerber, a couple of the technical panels on, to discuss the current research uh, coming off their acquired structure burns in Sydney, Ohio. So if you have questions, if uh, you've seen something, if you've heard something, if something doesn't make sense to you, or you just want to, quite frankly, call the, the BS flag on something because you just don't believe it, it just doesn't seem right, use the hashtag FE Talk. Ask your question, make your comment, we'll propose it to Steve as well as the, the technical panel members here today, and we'll get it answered for you. Um, if these guys can't answer it, um, I don't know who can, um, but I'm sure Steve will debut, uh, dispute that with me, and he can find somebody that, that can't answer it, or he'll run a test to figure it out for you. So first, I want to welcome Steve. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, PJ. I, I won't claim to have all the answers, but you're right. If we, if we don't know the answer and we hear it enough times or – advisory boards or tech panels keep asking. That's that's where the research comes from, to try and answer those questions. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. I know uh, we've had some great conversations. I've learned a ton of ton from you as well, and hopefully the, uh, the questions will start coming in today. And uh, we'll come back to you in a few minutes and talk about the recent test in Sydney, Ohio, as well as the current research going on. And uh, we'll see what they got for you today. Happy to have. And uh, not in any other specific order. I'm just going all the way to the left on my screen. I want to introduce you to Chad Christensen. Uh, Chad is a, uh, a captain in L.A. County. He sits on a couple of the technical panels for ULFRSI. He recently has attended uh, the acquired structure burns as well as some of the laboratory burns. Um, he's an FDIC instructor, and uh, he's, he's all around. Don't tell Sean Gray I said this, but all around, he's a really good guy. So, uh, Chad, th thanks for joining us. PJ, thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Looking forward to the discussion today. We appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule. It looks like you're, you're home on a, probably on a day off, so we really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. And there's no uh, no guessing that our last guest, uh, Nick Papa, lieutenant from New Britain, Connecticut, we know he's home today, or he has a really comfy-looking backyard in his firehouse. So the, the Robins, I think, were kind of walking behind him there. Uh, Nick Papa's lieutenant here in Connecticut, in, uh, New Britain, Connecticut. Uh, he's also a technical panel. Um, on the, for the latest research, and um, he attended the live burns as, as well. He's an FDIC instructor. Uh, he assists uh, Frank Ritchie with his monthly uh, fire engineering. Uh, drawing a blank. Uh, well, talk to live show. talk radio show. Uh, he's a regular contributor to fire engineering as well. So Nick, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, PJ. I'm happy to be on with you guys, and looking forward to some great discussion this afternoon. Well, we appreciate it. you always bring some good stuff to the table. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. So I didn't get a lot of questions as I expected today um, to get regarding the research. I do have a few that I've already jotted down to ask the technical panels as well as Steve. But I want to start, I want to give Steve uh, Kerber, Director of UL uh, FRSI, the chance to give us an update. Uh, where are we with the current uh, research? Uh, what has been done? What still needs to be done? Do uh, um, have answers to anything yet? sure that we have answers because the enormous amounts of data that they actually have to capture and then decipher and, and put together. But Steve, if you could just give us a little update on some of the current stuff going on and uh, what you know and what you don't know. Oh man, how much time do we have? It's, uh, take, take the whole hour. Uh, we're finishing up a training project right now. So we've got four reports that are currently being written as well as an online training program that's being developed. Looking at everything from uh, trying to give tools to the instructor so they can bridge the gap between what they have tool-wise in their training arsenal versus what's happening in reality. 
uh, when you're burning pallets and straw or OSB or any of those things, the, there's a difference between that and furniture. So while we don't want instructors burning furniture, we also want to be able to bridge that gap. So we're going to be able to provide some tools to the instructors so they can bridge that gap. And uh, that's uh, getting wrapped up here by the end of the year. The project that you referred to at the Sydney, Ohio Fire Department, uh, we had the pleasure of partnering with them to do some two-story house fire experiments. That's part of the coordinated attack project. And really to sum up the coordinated attack project, it is putting all the pieces from all the previous studies together. So we studied horizontal, we studied vertical, we studied positive pressure, we looked at fire attack and uh, putting all those things together, um, what happens when you do what is believed to be good? What if you well coordinate your vertical vent with your fire attack? Uh, what if you get the fan on real quick after you knock the fire down? All of these questions uh, we want to be able to put some data to to show what does good look like, as well as answer some of those hanging questions out there that uh, have hung on since the fire attack study, which is along the lines of, well, what are the limitations of transitional attack in a two-story structure? When you're not on plane with the fire, how does that change? How is that a little bit different? And then uh, additional measurements of steam, hydrogen cyanide, things like that that we haven't been able to measure in the past as accurately as we want to, building up those measurements to a point where we can spread them out throughout the structure, uh, really look at how the tactics influence the occupant survival uh, and, and get a real clear picture of that. Uh, we're also going to expand out of the houses. So we did the first piece of the house fire experiments. I think we've got about 16 tests that we need to do. We did about 10 of those. We've got an additional set that we need to go to fill out the technical panels questions. And uh, we'll see where that takes us. We're still trying to nail down where those are going to take place. So you're going to see some more two-story house experiments. And then we're going to go to uh, apartments and then to strip malls. So it's, it's building on what's been done. We've looked at the individual topics. We've burned fires in the lab. Then the questions become, well, how does a fire in the lab compare to a fire not in the lab? So we go out to acquired structures, partner with the fire service, and and look at that and, and do those uh, do those experiments to answer those questions. And then it is, well, a lot of your stuff's been in houses or townhouses. What happens if you get to multi-story apartments with common stairwells? And then what happens when we start getting into commercial geometries where you've got bigger volumes and uh, things along the strip mall uh, scenario? So a lot of work to go on this project, but uh, we're excited to get burning and, and get the team out in the field and get a lot of data that's going to take some analysis. Uh, we expect to be piecing some of that together and getting it out to Chad, getting it out to Nick and the other tech panel members, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks. Well, Steve, as always, thanks for doing this. I know this is what your, your passion is, but you're really impacting uh, the, the fire service. As you know, you're impacting us individually, you're impacting our, our families, um, and you're impacting those in our community by giving us more options to truly know what we're doing on the fire ground is the best option. Um, so, so we appreciate it. And for those of you watching today or watching this and download, you know, Steve hit on a, a couple of things that I just want to hit on that I wasn't prepared to. And we talked about the technical panel and getting the information back to the technical panel before the rest of us and answering the technical panel's questions. So for those of you that are unfamiliar how this truly works, I was lucky enough to be selected for a, a panel a few years ago. So I have an kind of inside knowledge and basically we, I applied for the process, it was for the exterior fire and attic fires um, process, uh, panel. We went out to Chicago, Steve sat us all in a room and we kind of expected Steve to tell us, okay, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing it, and we just want you here to observe. And it was, it was the exact opposite. Steve brought us all in the room and we sat around this big co conference table and he says, so what do you want to know? What do you want to know about exterior fires? What do you want to know about attic fires? And then we started talking. We spent almost a whole day talking about fires we've been to and the questions that we've had and the tactics that we've used that we think worked and tactics that we may have done on the fire ground that didn't work. And they were taking a bunch of notes. We came back the second day and we talked some more. And they said, all right, give, give us a month or two and we're going to figure this out. 
And then his team came back to us and said, okay, you have these questions. This is what we recommend that we do to, to test that. And we said, okay, well, we like this. We don't like this. And AUL, Steve Kerber and his staff didn't guide what we were doing. It was the technical panel asking the questions that represented the fire service on a whole to get the questions that we wanted. Um, so for those of you that are still unfamiliar with the process, uh, please don't think that UL is dictating this stuff to us. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because Steve, Steve is on the call. I'd say this, you know, even if he wasn't here. They're looking to answer the questions that we have and to figure out what we've been doing for many years. If it doesn't work, um, if it works, and hey, this works, but there may be a different way. And not just how to do things, but why. And looking at things in a much bigger way or a different way. You know, we see things one one dimensional. I don't even have any idea, and I don't even know. Steve could probably give us a little better uh, clue of how many different dimensions that they look at every little piece uh, of what we do. Um, so this is us, the fire service, driving these tests, driving this research, and just uh, UL and Steve Kerber and his, his group. They have the ability to to figure it out for us. Yeah, we. I mean, we've got a. I mean, I think I got one of the best jobs in the world. It's uh, it's really working for the fire service. I mean, it, UL is kind enough to uh, take part of their not-for-profit funding and their not-for-profit mission and say, go work for the fire service. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to answer those what ifs. I mean, there's the fire service is in a very interesting position where you're, you've got a, a very challenging, very dangerous job, very dynamic job. And pretty much there's there's no way to try stuff i mean it's 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 you you have a set of sops you train on those sops you deploy those sops it's very locally driven because that's where a lot of the influence is that uh you're going to local fires local problems local people with local knowledge and uh i mean thanks to this platform and others that fire engineering have out there that allow us to look beyond our our local environment and see what's going on in other places but then that starts raising the question, well, what, why do they do it differently? Why is Chad going to deploy something different than what Nick is going to deploy, which is different than what PJ is going to deploy? We should have reasons that those things are happening. They should be based on uh, very easy to understand reasons. And in many cases, they're not. We see things done hundreds, if not thousands of different ways. And if there are reasons, then we should be able to show what those reasons are with the research by being able to recreate your work environment to answer those what ifs. Because uh, you're not going to go on your next fire ground with your crews and just start trying stuff when lives are at stake. That's not how this is supposed to work. So if we can do that in research, then uh, you're, you're left up to uh, digesting the results and figuring out what's best for your, your department to, to put into place by providing us with tactical considerations, right? See, that's kind of the key word is consideration. You're not telling us what we should do or how to do it. You're saying, here's your things that you should be considering on the fire ground and go figure out what works best for you and your department. I, I'd love to know everybody's reality. Uh, I wish I could come to all your fires, but the, the truth of the matter is that's that's on you. You've got to take those considerations and, and plug them in where, where you think they make sense. So, so I want to get to uh, a question that I have for both uh, Chad and Nick, and Chad, we'll start with you. Um, Chad, you know, you, I know you attended both uh, acquired structure burns as well as burns or research burns within the laboratory. Um, what differences did you see? And this kind of dovetails with one of the questions we have from Sonny O'Connor, who's a, a faithful listener of this show, and this was more towards Nick, but I'm sure it goes to, to Chad also. This is what's the one thing Nick was caught most curious about um, when he came to the research uh, inventing with Mars, and kind of the question about what he's written there. Um, so, what was the difference in between the acquired structure burns and the laboratory burns? That's one of the things that we always hear. We hear all. Oh, what did you see as far as differences? Uh, well, PJ, I think the biggest the biggest difference is uh, one was physically in the lab, and one was out in Sydney, Ohio. Um, you know, and uh, the great resources that, that Sydney was able to provide. Um, but as far as the, the actual test itself or how the fire behaved, I didn't see a whole lot of differences. Uh, visually, everything seemed to perform just as we would expect it to in that same structure that was in the lab. And as you know, and as Nick knows, and I mean, Steve's there every day, um, 
you know, that, that house that was in the lab in, in Chicago is as much uh, as a real structure as what I have in my first due every single day. Um, and uh, I didn't see a whole lot of differences. I think the big, the big difference or challenge that, you know, having been on both panels is uh, that the way that, that each test is uh, laid out per se, um, we don't have the same hallways in every single acquired structure. We don't have the same window sizes in every acquired structure. So the, the challenge becomes really on, on, uh, on Robin and, and on, uh, on Steve to, to put the comparisons together so they match up and so they can utilize them in their, you know, in the data and in, in the reports. But as far as the fire behavior, I mean, I, I think they, they pretty much played the same, uh, in both structures. Excellent. That's the one thing that I've, I've, I've learned over the time of being exposed to these groups and these great people like Steve and, and his staff is the fire is the same. It's physics. It's going to react to the environment that it's in and the building that it's in. It's going to react the same. Well, it may have some variations and some differences to the content and the structure itself. It's still going to, still going to go the same way. It's still going to burn, burn up and out. And if we don't do anything, we're going to have a foundation left. Um, Nick, what did you see? What differences did, did you see between the lab and uh, Sydney, Ohio? So this was my first technical panel. I did not have the pleasure of viewing the laboratory burns. So my only experience is with the Sydney, Ohio burns that just occurred a couple weeks ago. And again, ha uh, hats off to the Sydney, Ohio Fire Department and what they were able to provide for us for acquired structures, the amount of resources that they provided as far as manpower, equipment, and just a, a good experience you know, that the chief was an absolute gentleman and uh, as was everybody that we interacted with, at least in my experience. So I just want to thank those, uh, those gentlemen over there for, for a great experience. But uh, my big focus, and I was very thankful that I was able to make these experiments, was the experiments that were focused primarily on vertical ventilation and the timing of vertical ventilation with fire attack. So the experiments that I was involved in were vertical ventilation initiated just prior to the onset of extinguishment and one experiment was with the vertical ventilation occurring directly over the room that was involved and the other one was just at the top of the stairs in the landing directly outside the room that was involved and those that was what i was most interested in and one of my primary drivers for for wanting to be a part of this experiment and uh, in this study was one of the the pieces that people are still seeking more information on and aren't 100 percent sold on is the timing of ventilation especially as it pertains to vertical ventilation uh you know i've gotten into some some pretty good discussions on online on facebook about you know i believe uh, dennis lagier was one of the, guy, the guys that i had a pretty lengthy conversation about was he posed the question to me does vertical ventilation necessitate the same degree of discipline as horizontal ventilation and there was some back and forth there and, you know, based on some personal experiences, you know, some you know, variance in opinion. So I wanted to see from the street view anyways, what was actually going to occur. Were we going to get that that lift that that everyone speaks about? And because anybody who's made a hallway at some point or another has felt that distinctive relief when vertical ventilation takes place as you're making your push down the hallway. So that's what a lot of people are, are relying on when they, they they're ta they're talking about the the benefits and the experience of vertical ventilation and you know, the timing piece. So we were very anxiously awaiting these experiments and seeing, all right, did, if vertical ventilation occurs before the onset of extinguishment, are we going to get that, that telltale lift, uh, that raise in the neutral plane that, that we would have been able to see from the street, uh, the street side? So standing out in the street, which again is a interesting perspective just in itself, because you know, being uh, being a lieutenant, I'm used to being on the inside, and it gives me a new profound perspective for for you, chief officers, uh, standing out in the street. But we, uh, uh, Chris Stewart and Brad French, and myself, were were out there for those exp uh, experiments, and from our vantage point out in the street, when vertical ventilation occurred, both in directly over the uh, the seat of the fire and just outside, there was no visible change in the neutral plane from the windows. Um, and in speaking with the gentlemen that were inside making the interior attack, um, they did say that they had a, um, a measurable degree of uh, visibility increase. 
but the heat did not lift up off of them. Uh, if anything, they said the, the heat was was elevated. And one of the, the conversations that I, a little sidebar conversation I had with uh, with Steve, and he had posed the, the, the comment that, you know, hey, the, we may want to look into this a little bit further. And this, this uh, change in visibility may not be a lift per se. It may just be the fire leaning out because now we're, we've introduced more oxygen. We've caused the fire to burn more efficiently. And in, in turn, now it's not producing as much, sp uh, as much smoke as it was prior. So it's not, um, so that, that perception of, of lift in this case may just be the fire's burning a little bit cleaner and that's what's giving you the, the enhanced visibility. So I'm very, very anxiously awaiting the, uh, the data to be extrapolated and um, examined to see what actually happened and to take a look at the, the, the changes in the heat and mo most importantly, what uh, Dr. Gavin Horn and his crew have uh, been able to do and the advancements that they're making in measuring victim survivability, uh, the components is pretty impressive. So I'm very anxiously awaiting to see the results. Well, Nick, I'm really glad you had the opportunity to attend, especially for those experiments. And I know that you do a lot of uh, tactical ventilation, you know, education and training, and it's one of your passions. So I know that this is going to help improve whichever direction that this goes for you. It's definitely going to help drive your class to be even stronger and better and further educate us. And being able to see firsthand, and that was really eye-opening for me as well, because, you know, you, you could sit here and stare at this computer screen and look at the charts and the graphs and decipher the re reports, but when you could be there firsthand and then see those reports and graphs and diagrams, it really brings everything together. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. Glad to hear that that went well for you. And that kind of answers Sonny O'Connor's question then, because he wanted to know, what you were most curious about when you came to the to the burns. So uh, thanks for answering that. Uh, Steve, do you have anything you want to uh, add to that before we go on? No, I, it's, it's fun to have, and, and I kind of give this preamble with all of our visitors that come, and whether it's the local fire department that's hosting us or the tech panel advisory board, whoever's there watching, is that step back and take it all in. You, you don't get the opportunity to go watch a fire from start to finish, ever. Uh, unless you lit it, in which case that might be your last fire. So it's, uh, I mean, to have the firefighters be able to watch from ignition to growth to arrival to tactic intervention and all of those things, it's its not only the chief view, but you're getting the view from before anyone gets there, which I think from a understanding fire dynamics perspective uh, really is a, is a unique opportunity and you're right, it's, uh, I mean, we capture that thing from every angle we can possibly capture it from with video and thermal imaging and data and everything else. But it, it definitely helps to stand there in the street and, and watch it and, and see how it changes and what goes on. And uh, just to add to what Nick said, it's, it's okay, so his, his observations and his interview with the crews that did suppression are, is one set of data. Now we've got to go ahead and put what he thinks he witnessed with what the temperatures are, what the heat fluxes are, what the gas concentration measurements are, the steam measurements of where the moisture is, the hydrogen cyanide measurements. All, all of those paint the complete picture to match what he saw with what was going on in all those other locations in the structure uh, that can answer the question, what about the victim? And what we have two really, two real victim locations is what we call them, essentially sets of measurements that are meant to replicate an occupant as well as you possibly can and better than we ever have. We will have one essentially close to the fire and one in an adjacent bedroom that uh, will really help us understand the, those tactical choices with that victim exposure. What? I got a question uh, that somebody submitted, we'll get to in a second, that talks about steam with exterior water. So that would be kind of good to highlight with, with that conversation. Chad Dern, you know, you've sat on two technical panels now, so you've seen the burns in, in uh, Chicago in the lab, you've seen acquired structure burns. What types of things have surprised you? Did you go into any one of these technical panels assuming you knew something? This, this was the best way. This is the way I've always done it. This is always right. And then walk out with a new uh, new uh, perspective on, on certain things. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you know, 
the the couple of years we spent just on fire attack alone uh the amount of things that i learned personally and uh, i think other guys on the panel learned uh were incredible understanding that the east coast tactics are different than west coast tactics because of building construction because of what our first do looks like because our hose loads are different our staffing levels are different and bringing those together i mean it took us probably you know a couple of us on the panel you know a good year to understand that what happens in their department is different than what happens in my department because of our staffing levels and and uh you know, what our buildings look like and, you know, what are we going to on a daily basis? Um, and, you know, the other thing that I learned and, and, uh, and, you know, Steve knows very well because he saw all the emails that went back and forth, but, um, you know, I was very much a, an advocate of from what we knew and, and coming from a department that didn't flow water for years until we saw the seed of the fire and this push to flow as much water as we possibly can. And, um, I would say that the, the water application, uh, air entrainment, um, water mapping piece of that study from the fire attack was uh, so valuable for us in our department and understanding that the amount of water that you flow, uh, where does it go and how can it be effective and how should we be flowing water um, as opposed to being worried about, you know, and, and I'll let Steve get into where does the water go and what about the steam and what about the victim? And, uh, you know, what about the timing getting to the victim and how can we be most effective for those victims? And I think all those things became very, very uh, prevalent in uh, the fire attack study. I, I learned something new all the time, you know, and, and even just from listening to Nick and, and going back, uh, we were there for um, not really any of the vertical vent uh, uh, study uh, burns in Sydney but uh, a lot of horizontal stuff and a, a PPA uh, test. And, but we went and we took the time and went back to every structure that they had burned prior to our, our uh, test burns and got a lot of questions, got a lot of questions from those studies. They're the burns that you saw, Nick, um, you know, for the vertical vent stuff. And do we need to, to, you know, as a panel, have discussions of, you know, do we need to investigate that piece more? Do we need to do this? Do we need to ask this question or get that answer. And uh, I think that's the greatest part about being on both these panels is the continual knowledge that, that I gain and am able to, to take back to my department or, you know, any classes that, that we teach. Um, it's, uh, it's continually learning and continually taking those pieces. You know, you talk about Nick's visual uh, takeaway from that burn. I remember being in, uh, in Chicago in the lab for one of the first burns uh, for the fire attack study. And I was standing next to Steve and we watched the smoke stop coming out the front door while, uh, the fire attack team was going in and applying water as they pushed down the hallway. And I looked at Steve and I went, what just happened there? And even Steve said, I don't know, we're going to have to look at the data and get back to it and figure out what did just happen. And, uh, you know, I think that goes all into the steam stuff and contraction and everything that I'll let Steve talk about. But, uh, always always learning uh, different things from each test burn to each study it's it's incredible Steve? oh you want me to talk about steam is that, is that where sure. we're at so i heard you want to hit anything on there or, or actually let me ask this one question because it kind of goes along with everything i'm going to read it from uh from brian on my facebook page um and talking about an exterior water uh, application video he says so after water was put in the fire from the inside you see clouds of steam smoke and gases venting from windows due to conversion and this stream of water pushing these products of combustion throughout the building. If you were to hit this fire from the outside and the stream of water is pushing in the opposite direction, where does the steam, smoke, and hot gases go in order to escape to improve conditions inside? All right. Lots, lots there. Um, so the <laughs> so the the biggest piece is understanding how gases flow within a structure to begin with water no water whatever the case is when you have a fire and uh one of the one of the big things to to compare there is when when you do the when you have the scenario that was just described you have a vent opposite uh where the hose line is so as we saw in the fire attack study, you can create a you can create a flow 
and you can keep gases moving with your host stream because of air entrainment. And uh, air entrainment is simply the, the drag of air that goes along with water droplets that creates pressure changes, which allows you to dictate the movement of those gases inside the structure. So when you talk about clouds of steam and everything else, all, all you're looking at there is what, what, what is moving? What are you able to move? And then you've got the complexity there of that water converting to steam, absorbing energy, and also contracting those hot gases. So it's this balance of cooling as well as expansion of gases, depending on how that energy is cooled, whether it's hot surfaces or whether it's hot gases. And then ultimately, what is the ventilation configuration? And in many cases, when you're providing water from the exterior, you're flowing into a dead end. You're, you've got fire coming out of an opening and uh, water goes in that opening. And then we, we provide the, the suggestion or the data suggests and the research suggests that you wanna keep that water on a steep angle. You wanna fill the least amount of that opening as possible with your stream, keeping a straight stream and a tight stream because those are the two components that totally minimize air entrainment. So it's all about the, the air being forced in, which if you use a vertical stream, the component going in is actually minimized because the majority of the drag is going up and not into the window. And then the less of that window that you fill, the less droplets that are off of that straight stream or solid stream, the less drag that you have. So you can really minimize the amount of air that you take in. Now counter that with the scenario that was described. If I'm going down that hallway and I wanna turn those gases around and I'm using a straight stream or a smooth bore, I wanna be whipping that straight stream or smooth bore around to fill as much of that hallway as possible or even open up a fog stream to entrain more air to keep everything moving ahead of me and out. So now when you do that on the inside, you're doing the opposite of what I just talked about. You're now creating as much steam as possible because you've got the, as many droplets as possible and you're in training as much air as possible to give you that look of a, a force of steam and clouds of gases and everything else coming out through that opening. So whether you do it from the inside or do it from the outside, those are the principles that guide your ability to move gases. So when you want to do it, you know what to do. And when you don't want to do it, you know what to do. And then there's this cooling component. Um, when we take gases from 2000 degrees down to 200 degrees, there's a tremendous contraction that takes place. And really it becomes, if you can balance your water application amount to the cooling produced by that water, you can actually counteract all of that expansion and there will be no expansion. There will actually be a net contraction of the gases in that room. And we saw that in the fire attack study where we're measuring the flow in the doorway opposite the hose stream. And if we were to expand gases more than we contract, we would have got a flow of gases out of that room and into the hallway. What we actually measured was a net movement of air from the hallway into the fire room because we applied water in a very efficient manner that ultimately contracted those gases from 2000 to 200 and you got a net decrease in gases. Um, that's tough because we're all taught that steam, that water converts to steam 1700 to one. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that was an IFSTA question, which is why everybody knows that then you need to pass the fire one test. Um, but if you ask people, well, what happens if you cool gases from 2000 to 200, how much does it contract and you get crickets? Um, because that was not a test question. And that's not as easy to define uh, with a uh, theoretical full-blown conversion. So, I mean, when we, when we talk about that, I mean, the, uh, the other component when it comes to steam that I think is really important is one of the main byproducts of combustion is water vapor. As you burn stuff, you produce a lot of moisture. And uh, in the Sydney burns, we actually saw this in, we had a giant house and Chad was there for, for these burns. 
that we, it was so big, we actually converted it to two houses so it could match the other experiments we did when Nick was there. And there was an HVAC system in this house and there was so much moisture that was created during combustion that we had water running down the walls in the side of the house that we did not do a fire in. And it just came out of the smoke. Um, it was it was not a result of suppression. We saw that water running down the walls before any water was applied whatsoever. And that's the other big thing. And then what we saw in fire attack that we measured is moisture tends to go up towards the ceiling and not as much towards the ground. So if our, if our occupants are low, uh, they're going to be exposed to much less moisture than perhaps if someone were standing at five feet. But at the same time, they're going to be getting a hell of a lot more heat and a hell of a lot more toxic gases as well. So it's uh, the whole concept of getting low as you get out. Not only does that uh, increase your, your intake of gases and heat, but also your, the moisture of those gases, which could potentially create other problems in your inhalation. So lots there. Steve, what were the fuel packages that were creating that much uh, moisture in the building? You name it, anything. Um, I mean, you, you burn something as simple as as methane and water vapor is one of your uh, byproducts of combustion if you do the chemical conversion. Think back to science class that's uh, on one side of the arrow and the other side of the arrow you get water vapor on, on the products of combustion side or the products of that reaction. And uh, I mean obviously we're burning furniture. I mean we're burning beds and mattresses and mattress toppers and carpet and carpet padding and chairs and lamps and even the curtains that Nick hung up uh, so so well. We burn those up as well. Lamps, uh, you name it. Uh, tremendous amount of moisture is created. And of course we bring more moisture to the game. Uh, but now we have a much better knowledge of where that moisture is going. Uh, so we can either use it to our advantage or our disadvantage. I mean, if you think steam's only created by an exterior water application, uh, we, we see the same thing on the, on the inside during interior attack. So depending on where you want to put your victims in the structure, uh, it's important that you know uh, those impacts regardless of how you attack that fire. Nick, I see you unmuted your mic. He's ready. That would tell me you're ready with something. <laughs> so just so everybody's clear, the rooms that were burned in were fully furnished. They are no different than any room you would find out in the street. It was to the point where, as Steve uh, alluded to already, uh, Chris and I actually uh, helped hang the curtains that were used in, in one of the experiments. So these rooms have mattresses, box springs, uh, comforters, pillows, uh, you know, the curtains, even so much as the pictures are hung up on the wall. I mean, every every little detail to make it as realistic as possible is 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 taken into consideration and followed through on, so that these these experiments are just as if if, if it were a fire that we we'd respond to in our respective departments. Excellent. Yeah. Dad. Yeah, I mean, Something you the FDIC in our hot class, you talk about exterior water application or just water application in general. And you have a really good handle on uh, water mat. Um, I don't want to break it down simple, but we only do have you know, like another 20 minutes or so left. So let's take a few minutes to talk about that, whether interior stream or exterior stream, what's actually happening when the water leaves the nozzle, what you've learned from some of the research as well as your firsthand experiences in LA County. Wow. Well, I mean, really, uh, thanks to the water mapping, we we figured out. I don't hear you, Chad. What's that? Can you hear me? Did you guys hear Chad or no? No, uh, he's muted. I think. Oh. Chad, are you muted? No. No. You there? There you what? go. Now you're good. Okay. Um, you know, thanks to thanks to the water mapping piece and the air and drainage piece uh, in the fire attack study, we learned a ton. And I think Steve's already touched on it, that really the reality is for everybody that the fire doesn't know where the water's coming from. If the water's coming down the hallway or coming from an exterior window, the fire doesn't know as long as we apply that water appropriately. Um, angles matter, like Steve talked about, that the steeper the angle, the more effective that stream's going to be. Um, and really one thing that we even learned just uh, back at FDIC in the hot class was 
we built that 16 foot hallway and uh, the steeper the angle you take, you can encompass that water will travel the surfaces unlike we originally thought, right? We thought that water is going to hit the ceiling and rain down like a sprinkler head. It reacts like a sprinkler head, but it doesn't get to the center of the room. It travels those surfaces until it hits an angle and then it's going to rain down those walls or ride those walls down. Uh, one example we used to uh, the guys in the class is go out and wash your car or the next time you go out and wash your rig, take that garden hose and spray it against the back compartment. Where does that water go? It travels those horizontal surfaces. So having an understanding like Steve talked about of how we can move gases with the air that's entrained in the stream, well, how we can cool those gases and cool that environment by how we apply that water. The steeper the angle, the more coverage we're going to get in that entire room or that entire hallway. So how does that affect us and our operation in LA County? Um, it's all about getting water on the fire, regardless of where it's from. If we've got a delay at the front door and we've got a window open on the A side, let's get that water in that window and cool that environment down to make conditions better for any victims that uh, could potentially be in there. Um, the other thing that we talk about is, uh, you know, keeping it on that, that, uh, absolute in one spot. And if one challenge that we have as firefighters is we want to wave that stream back and forth across in that window because we think we're going to be more effective in cooling that environment. And keeping that stream in that single spot is going to be just as, as effective as waving it back and forth. The steeper the angle I get, the more I have the ability to, one thing we show at, uh, in our class is the steeper the angle I get, I can actually capture that back wall of that room from that exterior position, as opposed to just capturing that rear wall or, you know, that line of sight area. Um, I think one thing that, uh, that we've learned from the air entrainment piece too, and, and, and water mapping is where does that water actually become effective or when did those droplets become effective to start cooling gases and get that contraction like Steve uh, referred to. And we've all been there. We've all, you know, been on that interior when a guy's put a straight stream through the window and had felt those negative effects or we're in that hallway and we're trying to spray and pray around in that bedroom to knock that fire down. Well, when does that water become effective? It only becomes effective when we break up those large droplets in that stream, regardless if it's a straight stream or a smooth bore. It's not until we break up those droplets, that they become effective. So if I can put them vertically over my head, inside that door frame, inside that window frame, and I can flow for five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. I can capture all of the surfaces in that room at the same time and get that contraction. Am I gonna put the fire out? No, we've proven that. The regrowth possibility is, is absolutely there live and well, and we've got to go in and put that fire out. But, but based on the data that we've seen from, from all the recent research, putting water, on the fire and slowing those gases down, slowing that the uh, production of the hydrogen cyanide and everything else that's negative in there for potential victims, we can actually get lift, we can actually get contraction, and we can make that environment better for the victims or for us as we're making that push. Um, you know, like I talked about earlier, I come from a, a department in a culture that up until about six, eight years ago, when we started really looking into UL research, we didn't flow water. It was uh, water to the side of the truck when he gets to the roof and, and cut the hole. And uh, I know it still kind of confuses Steve on why we go to the roof and, and get vertically ventilating at the same time as fire attack on the inside. But again, cultures, right? East coast, west coast. Um, and now we're actually flowing water and we're teaching guys that fuel is smoke or uh, smoke is fuel and that we need to cool those gases as we as we go. And it's not such the race. And there's communication between the ventilation crew and the fire attack crew. And we're flowing water on the inside. And we're recognizing that if there's a neutral plane of foot off the ground, that, hey, their deductible has been met. The damage has been done. Let's cool those gases, cool that smoke, and make things better for us or any victims on the inside. So, PJ, hopefully it wasn't too much, but hopefully I answered your question in, in, a, in a timely manner. It's never too much from you, Chad. I always enjoy listening to you. <laughs> Nick, based on some of the things that, that Chad was saying, um, you know, and I, hear, I know here in the East Coast, we're a little slow to change on just about everything. 
Um, but being a lieutenant on an engine company, have you been able to try anything different based on some of the research? Have you seen any, have you seen any anything work? Have you seen anything not work? And I know you're running New Britain with four firefighters per piece, a little bit a lot different from what I'm running with here. Uh, but what have you been able to try, if anything, in New Britain, and have you seen any successes? So uh, one of the things that uh, that I've I've done is well, from the start and. Uh, is the, the the flow and move concept with with my crews, and we spend a, a great deal of our time training on handline mechanics and hose line advancement to ensure that they have those skill sets to be able to flow and move uh, on their approach down the hallway, and you know, because that does provide you that that layer of protection and um, you know to steal a line from air and fields. It's you know you're cre you're basically creating your own pressure front with the handline when you're flowing and moving, and you're uh, working it in that wall ceiling wall pattern, you know, wh whichever pattern you choose to use, and you're you're basically providing that layer of protection for for you as you move down the hallway and you're cooling as you move until you can hit the, the seat of the fire and complete that uh, final extinguishment. And for me, uh, one of the pieces that I gained from uh, from it was, you know, the nozzle mechanic. Once you do hit that seat of the fire, and you know, making sure that. It, you know, when you go from the wall ceiling wall and the, the vigorous nozzle movement down the hallway, that once you do hit the hit the seat of the fire and you do arrive at the room of origin, that that changes to the the steady steep angle until you get that that knockdown and then you can go to extinguishing the surface fuels. So for one of the things that was commonly done, at least in my personal experience, was continuing to whip that nozzle around once you made the room, and now that based on the water mapping and the airman train, trainment studies, we've learned that, well, no, we want to change our, our approach that once we hit the seat of the fire, it's that steep angle, keeping the stream uh, steady, making sure we're uh, in training the, the minimum amount of air once we're in the room, getting that uh, that good water mapping. And then once we get the knockdown to then you know, mop up and get the uh, remainder of the, the burning surface fuels. So for me, it's just the, nozzle mechanics, getting the efficient the efficiency of, of water usage and doing the doing what's going to be most effective for for knockdown and, and more importantly is the, the victim survivability piece is is what really everybody's it, sites are, are really focused on. And for those of you that are in what we're talking about if that's me or not. Uh, a little bit. Uh, let me try that again. So uh, the UL Firefighter uh, Safety.org, you can find all the videos and explanations as far as in you know, research papers. And I, I also believe there's a, there's a training uh, model also. Is that correct? So it's all there on the website. Uh, everything from uh, if you want to get crazy technical into scientific journal articles to the middle of the road, which is the research papers, the technical reports, to the fire service summary reports, down to the online training programs, down to the long videos, down to the two minute videos. It's we're, we're trying to, down to the tweet, down to the Facebook post, you name it, we're trying to hit everything across the board uh, so that people consume it the way they want to consume it. But I mean, as we sit here and talk about this for for the last however many minutes, it's you got to talk it through. I mean, it's it's not easy. You got to sit there. You got to want to learn it. You got to want to digest it and apply it to your reality. Uh, we can put stuff out there on a website all day long, but if you don't go there and and go there with a purpose to learn something, then then you're not going to get anything out of it. So we, we're trying to make it as digestible as possible. But there is no silver bullet there, just like there's no silver bullet tactic. And you're not going to learn videos. You know, for those of you that are looking for a quick, easy answer or to reference something, the, the videos are great. And, you know, you all is doing a great job in their Tactical Tuesday uh, videos that are currently running on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but if you truly want to learn this information, you have to go and look at the reports, not just a summary report. Listen, I'm the last person to sit down and read a six, seven, or 800 page report. And it's definitely going to take you some time. But it, to truly understand all this information, you really have to dive into the reports uh, to truly learn what's going on. You're not going to learn from a two-minute video or a five-minute conversation. Um, this is a, a much higher level of education that, that I've ever been exposed to in the fire service. You have to really dive into it. Um, Chad? Oh, sorry, Steve. 
Uh, I was just going to say that the only reason there's six or 700 pages is because we include all of the graphs from all of the experiments from all of the instruments. If you strip off all those graphs at the end that are just there purely for transparency. I mean, an another big thing that we need to pay attention to is we need to be able to provide enough information that if other researchers want to build off of what we've done and not just repeat what we've done, we've got to provide all of the detail and that level of granularity. If, if a firefighter, there's a ton of freaking smart firefighters out there that, that know fire dynamics as, as well as anybody and probably have formal degrees, there's people out there that want to dig in. Your, your Nick Papa that says, you know what, I don't, I don't believe you. I want to dig into every little graph and make sure that this is painting the picture that I think it's painting. We want to make that information available as well. Um, so even in the online training programs, uh, we probably spend more time than we need to, but we, we make sure that you can click on every sensor and see what did that sensor read during the entire experiment. Uh, because we do want that transparency and, and for you to dig in if, if you do want more. Because you could probably write 50 reports if you were looking at every little nitpicking thing because firefighting is complex, but it also follows a very simple set of rules. I want to go to chat just because I know LA County has done a great job. Um, obviously, they have a budget that most of our departments don't have, uh, but with their, their their internal education. You know, one thing that uh, as a training chief I always struggle with is finding that middle of the road where I was so eloquently in back in Northbrook. Um, Put in my place by Chief Dorf. I'm not sure that we don't dump things down. Uh, he made it here in our time, but he really quickly put me in my place. Um, you know, so that's one of the areas that many instructors, including myself at times, I have trouble finding that middle of the road where we're not offering our membership up this level, where we're, they're, they're not interested, but we're not giving them that bot, that really low lying information where they're truly not learning. So, Chad, how did you accomplish that in, in L.A. County and how do you continue to accomplish that in L.A. County by making sure you're not dumbing down the information but also keeping it at a level appropriate for the, uh, the majority of your firefighters that are running, you know, running on engines and trucks in L.A. The county right now? Well, PJ, that's a great question because I think we still struggle with that at times, too. You know, we're in the, in the middle of rewriting uh, all of our um, lecture material for the recruits because there was a point where we got to teaching to – too high of a level and, and we're talking over their heads. Uh, when it comes to uh, our, our, our lion guys and uh, the guys that are coming out to the training center and we're putting them through the hands-on portions, um, we really took bits and pieces from UL stuff and what was most important, Steve's top 20 tactical considerations and broke it down and gave that piece to the guys. They don't have to read the, the summaries. They don't have to read the reports. We give them the, the meat and potatoes of what they need to know and bring them out to the training center and um, put them through some live fire scenarios, give them the basics of visually how door control can affect things, how water can affect things, how, um, you know, just uh, a vent limited environment can be controlled by a door open, a door closed, a little bit of water here, a little bit of water there and, and appropriately placed water. And then, letting guys go and, and do that on their own in a, in a scenario based uh, live fire environment. Uh, that's how we have really gotten the buy-in I think uh, as a department is bringing them out, doing the hands-on piece and, and allowing the guys to see firsthand how these things can affect the fire ground positively and negatively um, without trying to give them all of the science and all of the reports and, we're really trying to keep it as middle of the road as we possibly can for the guys. There's guys out there that want it. Like Steve said, we've got guys with degrees that are digging in. They want to know more information. They want to question this and question that. And that causes great discuss discussion amongst the guys, either at the kitchen table drinking coffee or on the fire ground uh, during or I mean, after an incident or an AAR or whatever it may be. Now, I think Nick has done a really good job, at least I know, in New Britain on really working on those fundamentals. He's put some you know, training videos up on fire engineering. He's written some articles and some blogs. And I know his focus, and I kind of set him up with that question before with the, the hose line, the basics of the hose line, hose line into place in the quickest, most efficient manner possible and flow water in the, in the most efficient manner that he needs. Uh, based on what he decides as, as the engine company boss on that day. Nick, is that right? 
Yeah, that's absolutely right, PJ. And you know, I share your sentiments in that it's very hard to find that that middle ground. And for for me, uh, you know, I'm a very big into systems, and I like to know how things work. And for me, I, I that's going down into the weeds and looking at every nut and bolt to see actually what it's comprised of, what makes it work. Because for me, that's how I conceptualize everything, and and I really am able to put it to practice. So that's what I've done over the last couple of years is really get down and look at where a lot of this information came from, not just from, you know, are the fire ground leaders that we, you know, we've all grown up reading the, you know, the, the Duns, the Normans, um, uh, Freed, and then going back even further to that, to looking at, you know, James Braidwood, um, Huget, Babrowskis. I mean, all these, uh, these other guys that, I mean, there's so much information out there. I really implore everybody to, to, to get into the, the information look, look at where a lot of this came from that, the, the baseline concepts that UL has been been researching over the last couple of years and actually developing and, and providing us with with hard data for a lot of the concepts have been around for some time now. It's just we're, we're actually providing the true understanding of it by having facts now where we have data. So that's allowing us to, to progress our education that much further. And it's it is a very hard line to walk with with educating to making sure that you know we're not going over people's heads that we're we're providing a, an appropriate level of of instruction and i think that's that's the balance that you know as an instructor we have to try and find that find that line and you know it's it can be de definitely difficult at times but the more understanding you have the better you can put it into context appropriately and that's been my my latest focus is really fine tuning the the, the content to provide um, that practical context that that people can actually they can really digest it and and have that epiphany moment where the light bulb goes off and they're like oh I can I can see that and now I can actually apply it on the fire ground and you know improve my size up improve my um, my ta my the execution of my tactics because now I can actually better read the environment I can s uh, better measure how my tactics are actually influencing the environment and it's just going to make us uh, more effective in the long run. You know, and Steve, I think you and, and your staff has done a phenomenal job because you've given, regardless of what type of learner um, you are or, or an individual is, like I said, that two-minute video to that 10-minute video to the 700-page report to the 50 or 60-page summary, uh, you've put it all out there. They're, you're extremely transparent. Um, how much you want to learn is, is all there for you between the training modules, the downloadable reports, uh, the videos. Um, so we really appreciate that. I'm sure if you have anything you want to plug as far as uh, your training and anything else that's on the website that some people may not know about. I think you're muted now, to Steve. I just want to add that firefighters are very visual learners. We, we all know that. And, and no matter how, how in the weeds you are, you aren't. It always helps to be able to see things and put the pieces together. So we, we really put a lot of effort into... Uh, video quality and consistency of message and uh, all different platforms and things along those lines all the way through, I mean, our Instagram channel. Um, it's uh, That's where my staff says we need to go because that's where the firefighters are. Then you know what? We'll put the effort, we'll put the investment in it, we'll go there and, and maybe we'll get somebody interested enough that they'll come back and take an online training program. But the, I mean, that is the that is the source of truth for us at this point is that even though we put things out in snippets, the goal is to get you back to the online training program. So you get the full message. Um, it's very easy to get things in pieces and want to pick them apart or put them in the wrong context or uh, get dismissive of the research or the results or whatever. But it's like, please, if you're, if you're going to start taking shots or, feel confused or something is not what you think you agree with because you heard it from someone's friends, brothers, sisters, moms, pal, then please go take the online training program and, and see what we're saying the message is. Because, I mean, always and never rarely apply. And there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of room for, for contextualizing the, the data and things along those lines. So we, we really want to make sure that the research results are used responsibly. And uh, ulfirefightersafety.org is where you can find all of this stuff. And 
follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, follow us on YouTube, follow us on Vimeo. All, all of that stuff is there too, but ultimately we want to get you back to the online training programs. And uh, Dustin, please, 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 please. you're hiring, you're hiring somebody for your content assistant. See, there you go. Uh, it's uh, so video dude Josh tells me, hey, man, I'm getting overwhelmed. We got too much video here. Uh, you used to just shoot like 10 cameras per experiment. Now you're shooting 30 per experiment. So you got to get me some help. So uh, if anybody out there and they're uh, they're a film student or they're excited about video or pictures or any of that multimedia stuff, we're looking for a uh, pretty much a, a part time uh, intern type person that wants to wants to help the fire service. We're we're looking for one of those. If you're a postdoc, we're also looking for a PhD student right now to help with some of our fire investigation research and some of our other work that we do with the fire service. And uh, we're also hiring a research engineer right now too. Uh, we've got a lot of great candidates that have that combination of fire service experience and engineering experience. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, chat yeah. towards the end of another minute or two to uh, talk about the research and talk about South Monday in your world in LA County or something you just feel is important to share this afternoon or this yeah. morning for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think, I think the, the biggest thing to, for everybody to, to keep in mind when it comes to the research is uh, we're not trying to lay out how uh, your timing goes or how your tactics go, but really how that fire, uh, um, reacts to the tactics that, that we're, we're looking at, you know, whether it's that vertical vent piece like Nick talked about or that positive pressure after knockdown, um, that transitional attack piece, that interior attack piece, the, the timing pieces we've really tried to uh, stay away from and allow the, the departments at, based on PJ, your staffing or Nick staffing or my staffing to employ those, those tactics and, uh, and how we adapt that research to our tactics on the fire ground for our agencies. So I think the, the timing piece we've really struggled with in, in back and forth. And uh, I think we've done a great job this time of laying the things out that it's not about the timing, it's about the tactic. And uh, dig in, go to the research and, and uh, go to the training pieces that Steve and his team have put together and, and really dig in and learn. Nick? Yeah, so before we conclude, I just want to... i got to interrupt you. you got Bambi running behind you. Oh, no kidding. I, I can see it now in the back of my screen. On your left shoulder, you got a... <laughs> yeah, i got the, the National Geographic in the background here. <laughs> but I, I just really want to, uh, to make everybody aware of what actually goes on behind the scenes for one of these, these research burns and the, just the research in, in overall. Steve and Robin and their team uh, just so unbelievably impressed by the amount of work that goes in, the drive that these individuals have, how committed they are. The, the first night I was there, I, I, I came in late and got to meet up with them for, uh, for a quick bite to eat before uh, th these guys turned in for the night. And let me tell you what, they look like they crawled out of a building collapse. I mean, just these guys were covered, you know, head to toe and dirt, sweat. I mean, Un unbelievable the amount of hours that are that are put in the the amount of thought it's just it's incredible i mean we as a fire service should be very you know very appreciative that we have you know this level of commitment to you know bettering our our craft and bettering our service and i i just one of the things that just impressed me the most was uh one of the guys that, that one of the, the senior engineers that worked for ul i, I believe Rob roy was his name was this guy had a work ethic that was just unbelievable i mean just outpacing guys that were half his age and just to, it's a, impressive to see that people are, are that passionate about what we do and you know making sure that you know we have as much information as we have to be to be successful out in the street so nick they weren't all dressed in like white coats and <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of those misconceptions that they're all just fire service engineer you know fire protection engineers and they're really not firefighters. They don't know what what we do out here, right? No, that's uh, that's it couldn't be further from the case. And and most most of the people that are involved are um, are involved in the fire service, and you know uh, most of them are vo are volunteers, and um, you know some of them are career are career guys as well. So I mean, it's the everybody's the, there's guys have skin in the game for for sure. 
Well, I appreciate you being involved in the panel. I look forward to, to seeing the results. I look forward to having some good conversations with you to see what you personally took away um, as we move forward. So, so thank you. Um, Steve, I had a question there, but I think when the deer and the, the baby deer kind of ran in the background, you kind of went, oh, I got it now. So another question that just came up as far as um, more opportunities for non-technical panel members to come and see live burns or acquired structure burns. Do you have anything kind of on, that they should put on their radar? You're muted. You're muted, Steve. Can I unmute him? I got the uh, Shannon Tammy mute, so I, I got to find that one. Um, yeah, Nick wins the best video bomb hump day hangout webcast thing ever. That was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> um, every series of burns we do, we tend to do a visitor day. Uh, we did it in Sydney, Ohio. Uh, we had, I think we had close to 100 people sign up to come out. I think we ultimately had probably 50 or 60 that that braved the weather and showed up in the rain and watched the burns. Uh, but keep an eye out on all of our channels. Uh, we, we like to give everybody the opportunity to come out. It, when we do the acquired structures, it's, it's really at the, at the discretion of the host department. So in this case, Sydney Fire Department, Chief, Chief Brad Jones, he, he was very open to it. Uh, we had a house that had the space. We got a big tent. We fed everybody and, and all of that other stuff. So we will continue to do that every opportunity we have. So keep an eye on our social media channels. Uh, we love having everybody come out, uh, walk them through the structure, show them what we're doing, show them what all the measurements look like, uh, grab a bite to eat together. And I think we, we sit there and we, we talked fire dynamics for an hour and uh, had a good time with all the tech panel members and everybody. So there's, there's always visitor days. Uh, we don't burn every week but uh, there's usually an opportunity a few times a year to come out to that stuff. All right, good. Well, thanks for that. Well, and I knew that this would probably be the case, but we're uh, about 10 minutes over uh, the time that we should have ended. Um, the next uh, Google Hangout that uh, myself and Frank Ritchie host is July 25th. Um, I'll speak with Frank. By that point, we may want to have uh, everybody back or some different technical panels back, uh, see where, where Frank's going. But July 25th will be the next live Google Hangout for Frank Ritchie and myself. Uh, Chad, uh, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate and appreciate all your contributions. Nick, thank you. We need to get together. We never see each other only a couple miles away. And no uh, Steve, I look forward to maybe bumping into you in, uh, in New Haven in your, your next trip up in the next couple weeks. Um, I thank all of you for coming today. Uh, for those of you that are, are watching the download version, if something comes to, comes to mind um, that not being live, you can't ask. Uh, find Chad, find Nick, find Steve, find myself on uh, Facebook, Twitter, email, wherever you need to, and send us the questions and, and let us help you. Um, if you get it to me, I'll get it to all three of them so you get uh, their each perspective. Um, we'll follow up. So this, just because the show's over doesn't mean that you can't still ask those questions. You still can't get those answers. So I appreciate everybody watching today. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing everybody uh, July 25th. Have a great afternoon. You too, PJ. Take care.